Hey, this is Lauren. Welcome to my YouTube channel, The Adventures of Boogie. So great to have you on. This setup is a little different from what I'm used to. I'm usually vlogging the random shenanigans that I get into, but I decided to um, become one a little bit more vulnerable to do a get ready with me and to share an adventure that I didn't volunteer for, but that it was kind of forced upon me but um, I'm making the most of it. And so I wanted to share that with you today. And that is my MS story. So yes, I do have MS, which is multiple sclerosis. Um, and it's a disease where your immune system eats away at the protective covering of your nerves. Um, and when you have nerve damage like that, it can affect the communication um, from your brain to your body. Me, um, because this disease is completely different for everybody involved. So you're going to see me transform a little bit. And so it's going to get worse before it gets better because I am a naturalista and we got to do our hair the night before. So get ready to see it. And you have a house, right? And in this house, you have mice. And it's a bunch of mice just running around. So your house is your body. The mice is your immune system. And um, the mice are going around chewing at the wiring of the house. And so in the while they're chewing up the different wires and different cords in the houses, um, you never know what, what room it's going to affect in the house. So the system is just running wild. It doesn't know what's good and what's bad. And so it attacks the myelin sheath. And um, that's supposed to be protecting my nerves. And yeah, it just sucks. But um, it affects everybody differently. So you could go to someone else's house who has MS and it can be a totally, they have totally different symptoms because it again depends on where that immune system, where the mice are hitting uh, and chewing up those cords and those wires. Another dope thing um, that just brings me peace, I always think back to this. So before I got diagnosed, I got the December before that, I had, I kept having these random acts of kindness given to me. And so I don't know if I'm like, just like the most unluckiest person in the world, but like, I never win anything. I never like, it's just, it just never happens for me. It's like, if there's a raffle, I know I'm going to lose. Like, you know, I'm like, it's just, it's just one of those things. And, and it's fine, like it's not a big deal. Like it just is what it is. I'm just not one of those lucky people. But that month of December, I mean like I would be standing in line um, in an airport getting, about to order food and the person in front of me like, hey, I just really like felt like God put it on my heart to cover your meal. And I'm like, oh no, you don't have to do that. And that's probably why I don't get blessed. It's because I'm always like, no, 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 don't do it. <laughs> no. But they're like, no, no, no. Like, I really feel like I'm supposed to do that. I had situations where I was like in a drive-thru. Um, and you know, like they do like the pass it forward, um, acts of kindness type of thing. Um, and so the person in front of me would be like, oh, I'm gonna pay for the next order. So I would get to the, you know, ready to give them my debit card. And they're like, oh, the person in front of you paid for you. So I'm like, oh, okay, let me pass it on to the next person behind me. And there'll be nobody behind me. And like, I remember one day in particular, like I stood, I sat there for like 10 minutes. I'm like, no, no, I'm gonna wait until somebody else comes. And literally they were like, ma'am, it's fine. Like we'll start it over. It's, it's not a big deal. And I'm like, no, I want to be a blessing to somebody. Just like this person was a blessing to me. And it like during the, that month of December, whether I was in a drive through whether whatever, like people were just texting me really kind things. Like it was just, I mean, not that people don't text me kind things on a regular basis, but it was just like the, that month of December, they, I was just getting hit heavy time after time after time, just with blessing after blessing. And of course, the only blessings I can remember right now are food related, but it was a plethora of things that like just kept happening. I'm like, man, like this is dope. So I remember having a conversation with my sister um, and she's a first lady of a church. And I was just like, 
yo, like, I really feel like God is trying to tell me something. And so she's like, what? What do you think he's trying to tell you? And I'm like, I really feel like he's trying to tell me that he's got me, he loves me, and he's taking care of me. And my sister's just like, oh my God, that's so beautiful. Like, yeah. And I was just like, yeah, I felt, oh man, I'm gonna try not to tear up. Oh my gosh. And I was like, yeah, I feel like he's really trying to prepare me for like something bad that's about to happen. But he wants me to be reminded of that promise that he loves me, he's got me, and he's taking care of me. And I'm, me and my sister, I'm a realist. Um, and I think my sister is more on the optimistic side of the scale. And she was just like, oh my gosh, you're such a Debbie Downer. Nothing's going to happen. God is just blessing you. Like, can you not just be blessed? And I'm like, no, like, I really feel like he's trying to prepare me and remind me that no matter what, he's got me, he loves me, and he's taking care of me. And um, she was just like, oh my gosh. Like, and so we ended the conversation and um, like forgot about it. And so then when March happened, I got diagnosed um, that first week. I was super like, I wouldn't even say like depressed or stressed. I think I was just naive. I think that's the best way to describe it is I was naive. I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. And um, I remember telling my mentor, uh, Pastor Kay, telling her about the diagnosis. I remember telling her about the diagnosis. And in that moment, in telling her that, I remembered the promise that was given to me in December. And when I say these last two years have been one for, I mean, it's it's been one, y'all. Like, it's not, like, not even joking. It feels like I just can't catch a break sometimes. Like, it's just like, oh, of course that's going to happen because... You know, just shambles. It's just pure shambles. But um, when I tell you I remember that promise, um, and I've been standing on that promise the last two years, and no matter how difficult it gets, no matter how bad it gets, um, that promise remains true. Um, and as much as I would not wish MS on my worst enemy, um, it's like God, God's really been faithful, um, throughout the whole process. Honestly, he has, and, um, I'm not even trying to make this, this deep spiritual thing, but like, you just, I just gotta be straight up hundred percent honest with you. It is what it is. And God's promises remain the same throughout it. And every time I get down, every time I get hit with a new challenge, every single time, I mean, I'm just constantly reminded that he's got me, he loves me, and he's taking care of me. And so um, I'm just really, really grateful for that. So, yeah, so I got diagnosed March 2018. Um, there was a bunch of symptoms that I was experiencing um, that made me go in finally. Um, actually, my friend Brianna, I had an overnight in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was a Sunday night, and for weeks I've been dealing with balance. I've been dealing with feeling intoxicated when I hadn't been drinking. Um, I had experienced... I think the most serious thing that I had experienced um, to me, I mean, all of those things are serious, but um, was double vision when I would wake up. And it would take usually each day about 30 minutes for it to restore. Um, but that particular Sunday when I was at Albuquerque, it took four hours for my vision to fully restore. And I just remember thinking to myself, you can't go blind, Lauren. Like, this is not something that you, the way you're sleeping this is this is something so i'm still stubborn i still hate it going to the doctor but i was like i have friends who are in the medical industry let me call them so i remember calling my friend brianna she's a physician's assistant and i remember telling her all my symptoms and how many weeks she she actually might have known before then um but i think that was like the first time i called her like yo like what do i do 
she was like, you need to go to your doctor right away. And I'm like, well, I'm in Albuquerque. She's like, you need to call them. I'm like, well, it's Sunday, I'll call them tomorrow. She's like, they, they have an emergency line, call the emergency line. And I believe she, in hindsight knowing now, she knew exactly what it was right away, but she just didn't want to freak me out. She wanted me to get checked out. And so, um, yeah, so I called the emergency line, got a nurse, got the nurse that was on call for the weekend. And she was like, oh, you need to come in right away. And I'm like, oh yeah, by the way, I'm in Albuquerque. So she's just like, as soon as your plane touches down tomorrow, you need to come in to the, into the doctor. So I said, okay. So I'm gonna go see my primary care physician. Um, he immediately set me up with the ophthalmologist um, and he set me up with a neurologist. The ophthalmologist was available, I believe, the next day or two. And the neurologist, because he's the top neurologist in our area, um, he had like a waiting list of like six months. Um, he was like top of his class at Northwestern and like he was just, I mean, he's legit. So I was like, okay, well, you know, still not thinking it's a big deal. I went to the doctors by myself again for the ophthalmologist. And I remember him sitting me down after doing a bunch of tests, like he would check my eyes. And I guess when my eyes would go a certain way, it would like flicker. And I think your eyes are just supposed to go naturally back and forth, but it would do a pause and wait. And you know, he did multiple other tests too. And he um, came in the room sat me down, looked me dead in the face and was saying, this isn't in your head. I believe you. Um, I believe these symptoms are real for you. And for me, again, I, I wish I would have taken more serious. But I was thinking like, oh, okay, what's his problem? Yeah, of course, like, it's not in my head. I'm telling you, I'm having double vision. I'm bumping into stuff. I'm falling. I'm feeling intoxicated when I haven't been drinking. Like, what, what are you talking about? But um, in hindsight, um, in hindsight, I realized um, just from different support groups that I'm in, people go years without a diagnosis and they're experiencing these things, they're experiencing fatigue, they're experiencing clumsiness, they're having double vision or blurred vision and doctors are literally telling them, oh, it's in your head and making them feel crazy until they come across a doctor who actually knows what they're doing um, so I don't know if he thought I had experienced that or that was just his method for breaking it down to people, but he knew right away it was a mess. So he was like, wait right here. So I'm thinking my appointment's over. No, he went upstairs, grabbed the neurologist, um, that the top neurologist that was six months out. And again, that's just like talking about like God's favor in my life. Like it really, it really was like, so he grabbed him and brought him down and Literally, the neurologist saw me that day, got me in, penciled in for that week. Um, and so I I can't remember if I brought anybody to that particular appointment with the neurologist. Um, but I think after, no, before the ophthalmologist, I called my sister. Crystal is the first to know everything. Um, and then when the neurologist started saying I needed MRIs, um, I said, oh crap, I got I to gotta tell my parents. I can't, they would, my mom, my mother would kill me if she found out I had a, an entire MRI and a spinal tap. It was, that was the thing. I needed an MRI and a spinal tap. And so I'm like, my mom would kill me if she finds out I had an MRI or spinal tap and did not tell her. So I told them, so after I, once I told them, I, I never went to a doctor's appointment alone. Um, that wasn't even a that wasn't even a thing, um, and so um, he wanted to run a bunch of tests because he said MS is a expensive disease, which it is. It's a full sham, and it's an expensive disease. Um, the medication that I'm on is is a payment for a house, like the entire payment, not a down payment, not a mortgage. It's a payment for a house, um, like a thirty year. Anyway. Let me not get upset about the cost of it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so um, after running tests, um, after doing MRI, after doing the spinal tap, um, my double vision, and the, like because I was in a flare up at that moment. Um, my flare up, I want to say, lasted a month. Um, 
from when I initially had signs and then, you know, because I, I was stubborn, I waited a couple of weeks to go to the doctor. Um, and so I couldn't work, I couldn't drive during that time um, period, which was annoying because I'm a pretty independent person. Like I just want to get, if I need something done, I just want to get up and do it. Um, they didn't want me to drive because, because the double vision was getting worse. Um, even though it was just in the morning and it would restore itself, they didn't have, um, they didn't know if while I was driving, if it would happen and they didn't want me like cause an accident or, um, with the feeling intoxicated, they didn't want me to have that experience while driving and then, you know, end up in an accident, which was wise. Um, so I ended up having to take FMLA for my job. I was out for a little while for work. I was out for a few weeks until my vision restored. Um, and then the medications, um, that's a whole nother beast, the medications. So when it comes to the medicines, um, there is no cure for MS currently. Um, they have medications that are supposed to help um, slow down the progression of the disease possibly. And so it's pretty much all a gamble. The first medication I was on was Tecfidera. That's a pill that you take twice a day, every day, for the rest of your life. For me, I didn't like the side effects of it, um, and it was something that I wasn't willing to sacrifice, um, which was, I was in, I was extremely, extremely depressed um taking tecfidera i think and that's a known side effect of it um a, a known possible side effect of it um and so i think that um being a side effect and then also i mean i had just gotten diagnosed i was over um like absorbing information like every little thing about ms i was reading which i do not suggest when you first get diagnosed at first so um, I would say, words to the wise, um, take information slowly and look at information that directly affects you and what you got going on currently. And then when you're at a better mental place, then you can, you know, dive right in. But it, I'm, it's tempting. It's tempting when you first hear the words of whatever your diagnosis may be to just dive in and want to know everything and know the pros and the cons and you know the possibilities because uh, the possibilities are endless with MS and so um, I think that also made me extremely depressed um, and then what I realized I was talking to my mentor PK um, and I was just telling her like how sad it was. Like it was a constant reminder because I had to take the pill in the morning when I first woke up and I had to take the pill um, before I went to bed. And it was just a constant reminder that like you're sick. And I think that for me was just way too much, um, especially with first being diagnosed. And it was just, it was a lot. And so when I say I was depressed, I mean, my family would like call and check on me and I like would be like, oh yeah, I went to church today. I hadn't gone to church. Oh yeah, I went out and about. Like I was literally laying, I had blackout blinds in my room. I was laying in bed all day. Um, I would get enough energy, enough whatever to go to work um, when I was finally able to go back to work. Um, but when I got when I got done with work, I was back in a bed in a dark room. Really, like it was, it was bad. So, after taking that medication for several months, I realized it's just not that deep. It's not that deep for me to be that depressed in order to stop the progression of a disease. He's going to be this depressed every day. I have to live my life. Um, so, I took myself off of it and I was really nervous about taking myself off of the medication. I don't know why I felt like my nurse and my doctor were going to like be upset that I didn't want to take that medication anymore, um, which is another like word, word of wisdom to people who are dealing with new diagnosis. Like this is your body. This is your life. This is what you have to deal with on a day in a day out. Um, and you're not 
gonna please the doctor you need a, you're the one who has to live with it so if something's not up to your own standard or if something you're not comfortable with something like be your own advocate it's so 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 important i was looking up the pricing for um these different medications and i will never forget the first time they told me how much this medication costs for tecfidera which is a pill that i take twice a day um they gave me the number um the price when I um, initially got it, but I had a, I couldn't remember it, so I had to look it up. So for 14 pills, now mind you, you got to take two pills a day. So 14 pills is going to last you one week. It's listed online for $2,000 and $2,026 for a week supply of this medication. And mind you, you're on this medication for the rest of your life. So there's 52 weeks in a year. For a year's supply of Tecfidera, you're spending $105,000 and $352. $105,352 for a medication that does not cure. It possibly stops the progression. Crazy. Now, grateful, like I'm extremely grateful. I have um, great insurance. Um, that covers it. Um, even my copay that the insurance doesn't, they have a program through the company um, that provides the medication. Um, so I don't pay anything, but I can't imagine people who don't have insurance, who have this disease. And like, how do you pay for that? Like, like how, how, how? Um, so once I got off tech for I had that um, conversation with my doctor. My doctor was super chill. Like, oh yeah, if it doesn't work for you, then it doesn't work for you. Let's try something else. Um, I tried Ocrevus. And there's different ways to pronounce it. Ocrevus, Ocravis. So you might hear me say it in different ways on this uh, video. Um, I love Ocravis. Um, and so it's a infusion. Um, it's a low dose chemotherapy that I get every six months. Um, so I love not being constantly boggled down with the thought of, oh man, I need to take my medication a day. Literally, um, I go in May and I go in November. And when I go into the infusion center, I'm there usually about five, six hours. And it's just through IV, they're pumping it through me. And it's supposed to lower my, it's chemo, so it lowers my immune system so that my body can stop attacking itself. And about five, I'll say five hours. The first hour, they're pumping me with steroids, um, Benadryl, and um, I think it's like an Advil. I might be wrong. It's like an Advil or Tylenol or something like that. Um, and I do that. And then... Um, the next four hours, well, yeah, the next, so six hours, the next four hours, they're pumping the actual Cravis in me. And then after that, um, I do an hour of observation to make sure I'm not having like allergic reaction. My throat's not closing up. Make sure I'm staying at the facility and just in case emergency. So, um, just think, and this is about to get way more vulnerable than I've intended on getting but um just thinking about the disease itself and how it's so unpredictable um i think i was sitting here thinking of like some of my greatest fears about it um i definitely will have to say especially in the beginning i had such a fear of the future i'm like well what's the point of doing such and such if i'm gonna be you know, struggling with MS the rest of my life. Major reason for this vlog and this YouTube channel is just to, like life goes on. And even if I do face different challenges, even if I do face different things, those things will happen when they happen, right? But right now, if I'm okay, I'm gonna deal with what I can right now. And I think that grasping that information, like grasping that concept, it's such a major, um, like, weight has been lifted. Um, I think another fear of mine is being a burden to people that I love. Um, because, I mean, nobody wants to be a burden to anybody. Um, and so I never want to be too much or 
you know, the like, oh gosh, she's sick again, or oh gosh, she's fatigued again, or oh, she fell again, or whatever the case may be. Um, so I'm still working on that one. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say I've perfected that one. I'm definitely still working on that one. Um, and just trusting that my support system, which man, my support system is top notch. I'm, I'm gonna be uh, completely honest with you. Um, my family is the most ride or die family I can like even from my niece and my nephew who are six and eight obviously my whole family's there my friends and, and I can't even list all my friends but y'all know who y'all are and I appreciate you so much I mean um I have friends when I told them my insurance would be changing um using their resources using using their contacts to make sure that I'm gonna be good and I'm gonna be able to be on the medication that I want to be on and um doing research and like it's just my, my support team is ridiculous like and there really is no reason for me to doubt the people who have proven themselves time and time again to be in my corner to have my back to love me in spite of um but it's a real fear that I have um and 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 I'm not gonna act like everybody's been supportive there's definitely been um people who have um distanced themselves and there's definitely been people who and for whatever reason I think I assume it's because of that um just because of the timing of it and, and everything um but it is what it is, you know, um, the support completely outweighs, um, the people who have backed away. Um, and I, I, I need to get over it. Um, but it's hard. It's hard, especially when you've had people walk away. Um, and I think a, a big thing for me, a frustrating thing for me initially with, realizing people were going to step away from from me and dealing with this is that dang I wish I could step away from this disease like that was a real thought in my mind like I wish it was just as easy as me being like okay I just I'm just not gonna interact with it anymore and um as much as I would love to to walk away from it it's it's not that simple for me I have to live with it um, and I have to find my new normal. I have to find things that um, bring me joy and bring me peace and bring me happiness in spite of. And it just kind of goes back to that promise of regardless of who stays and who goes, regardless of if it progresses or it remains the same, regardless of all the endless possibilities that comes with it, that promise remains the same, that God's got me, he's taking care of me, and he loves me. Um, and that has helped me quite a bit. Um, hold on, I can't do this and talk at the same time. Oh yeah, I blew it. I blew it. Oh, wait, I fixed it though. Ooh, eyes. Yes. Yeah. No, okay. Let me chill out. We want to not allow MS to control my life. Um, I have, I had this, oh, have had this really dope nurse and her name is Ruth. Um, and she was the neurologist's nurse. And she just, one is amazing. And she was calling to tell me that, you know, my MRI came back okay and the, the disease was stable and nothing had progressed. And she was just kind of like, I really been thinking about you and I've been praying for you. And I'm like, can they say that? I mean, I was appreciative of it, but I'm like, can they say that? Um, and, but she did. And I'm like, okay, Ruth. And um, she was like, I really get this like feeling like you're you're gonna be okay. Like you're you're gonna be good. And I was just like, all right, if if the nurse who deals with like this is all she deals with all day is neurological patients as far as like MS and all the other neurological diseases and she's been doing this for years. If she thinks I'm going to be good, I mean, God willing, I'm I'm going to be good, you know? And so it's just been things like that step after step just a constant reminder that yo like God's really got me. 
he's taking care of me and he loves me. And I'm like, again, I really wasn't trying to make this overly spiritual, but that's, that is what it is at the end of the day. New tradition with, with my support system, doing the MS walk. It's usually in April or March, April time frame. And we've done it the last two years. And it's just been, it's been really dope. Um, just to see people come out and walk. This past year we had to do a virtual walk. I had so many people on, on my Zoom call who were literally walking with me. Um, and it just made me feel so good. And so, I don't know, I just, I really, I really have a dope support system. And I think if you're facing anything in life, you, your support system is crucial. I have a support system that's gonna be praying for you. You don't have people in your life who are going to just be that ride or die, call you and check in on you. Um, you I can't believe how many people just like, like, oh yeah, you were on my heart and I wanted to reach out. How's it going? No, for real, what's really going on? And I mean, that's, that's everything to have. Um, so this is an adventure. It's an adventure that I did not choose for myself, nor would I choose for anybody else, but it's, I'm fixing my mind frame to believe it's an adventure and I'm going to, I'm going to kill it. Honestly, I'm about to kill this adventure. Um, just like the skydiving, just like the jet skis. Um, it may not be as fun all day, every day. Um, but I'm ready for this journey, honestly. So, so yeah, so I guess I would just encourage anybody who is new to the MS world or has been in the MS world, like this disease does not have to stop you. It, um, which earrings should you wear? That one. Um, it doesn't have to stop you. You can you can keep pushing on. There's so much life to live, honestly. And um, I can't let my support system down. I can't let myself down. Um, have have friends, which I have probably way too many friends like this who will let me feel sad for a second. And then they call, call me right up out of that thing, like girl. And then start cracking jokes. Um, I've had I've had days where my sister will just come in the in the in the my bed with me and like just lay with me and, and we'll talk and we'll watch Netflix and we'll play cards. Um, and that oh man, I'm trying not to cry. I got my makeup on and everything, but um, that has been that offers more than what you can know. Um, and so I, I literally could, could not thank my support system enough. And I'm really over here trying not to cry thinking about it because they're just so dope. I mean, they're so freaking phenomenal. And I'm too cute to be crying, y'all. Um, so I was really nervous about making this video. Um, and it's not going to be a lot. This, this YouTube channel is not going to be about my MS. Because uh, my life is not about MS. Um, it doesn't circle itself around it. Um, will, will you hear me say things like, oh, fun fact, I balance issues. Yeah, you'll hear, you'll hear those commentaries and now you know why. But I don't want it to be um, an MS channel. Um, I want it to be the Adventures of Boogie. Um, and even though this is an adventure, that's not the only adventure I'm on. I'm doing a lot of dope things. I'm, I'm having fun. I really am. I'm finding peace. I'm soaring. I'm thriving. And um, I'm just, I'm excited. So I'm going to show y'all this outfit. Put the blue jean jacket on so it wouldn't be too whatever. But you see me. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for watching.